back. Uh, what we are doing back there is we're building a booth to move all the sound equipment, all the computer stuff back to one central location so we don't have a spider web of wires running everywhere. Last week, you know, we had a little bit of a tension problem. We're trying to get rid of all that by utilizing all in the back back there. So that's what's going on. So sorry for the construction type stuff, but we'll get cleaned up and look pretty good here hopefully next couple weeks. So any questions, please let me know. So to get started and read scripture. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine that's coming through to remind us of what promises you give us, that we need to shine the light for you out there in this community, Lord, in a darkness that seems to be pretty thick, but your light can shine through anything. Be with us this morning as we praise you. Help us to always be mindful of what you have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll be standing.
that leads me to no words right now. How many of you take it? How many of you have taken time? I would say this week, but how many of you have taken time lately just to let your mind focus on Jesus? In our Sunday school class, I tried to point that out this morning about Jesus. Just his name alone scares demons. His word scares demons because they know who he is. So at this time here, we're just going to use this time as your meditation time. I'm not going to put words in your head this morning. I think these songs this morning, they didn't put enough words in your head about who we're meeting around the table for. I don't know. I, I don't have the extra words. That's for sure. So let's just pause for a time of reflection here and then we'll participate in the table. Good thing this morning. I saw several people I didn't know this morning coming in. So, just a brief explanation of why we're coming around the table. Those of us that come around weekly know that's because Jesus gave His life and shed His blood on Calvary to give us forgiveness of sin. And that's what I'd like for everybody to know here, guest or uh, the body here this morning. But this is why we're taking it because the salvation involves Jesus. To give his life that we might have forgiveness of sin. He took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Heavenly Father, as we come around your table this morning, we participate with the emblems representing your body and your blood. There are no words how to say thanks for this. But if we're sinners and we need a way out, we need to look to you. We need to continually look to you as we live through our lives. We need to continually remember the great sacrifice that was made so we could eventually someday be with you in heaven because we were cleared of our sins and been taken care of by you. As we honor you this morning, we thank you for fulfilling your mission here on earth. In Jesus' name. Good morning. If you are a kid, they've got a class back there. Brendan is teaching today. He's got his cool kid t-shirt on, and he is ready to rock and roll back there. Um, so if you are in elementary school, we encourage you to head on back. Um, he's got a really cool lesson for you today. For those of you that aren't cool enough to be back there with Brendan, I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever had a friend or a relative that you were really close with and whether because of an argument or a disagreement or you both had different goals in life, 
your relationship was cut off with them. I'm not just talking about a relationship where you still talk to each other, but on the inside you're going, ah, I can't stand that person. I'm talking literally cut off where you have nothing to do with that person anymore. You don't talk to them anymore. You may not even know if they're still alive. That's how cut off you've become from them. Either it's because they won't talk to you, you won't talk to them, or neither of you will talk to each other. That's what a truly broken relationship is. Completely severed. And a lot of times this happens because... We Like we talked about when we talked about division a couple weeks ago, we have our thoughts, they have their thoughts. But there are some times where we say we're going to follow what God says and they're going to still say, uh-uh. Can we control somebody who says, I don't want a relationship with you anymore? No, I wish we could. I mean, if we could um, go around and as Stan talked about this morning about a mom going over and grabbing a kid's ear, I wish we could do that. And go over and grab someone's ear and say, stop being childish. We're going to be friends now. And pull them over. But we can't. There's a struggle with it, isn't there? It's a lot like, do you remember back in middle school and high school, and those of you that are there now, dissection day. Dissecting a frog. And they give you the frog. And some of you may be at the age where you still had to, they give you the frog alive. And maybe you tried to free your frog and the other frogs. For those of us that are younger, they just gave us a dead frog. And they said, cut this guy open. And actually, the teacher gave you the frog and said, here's what I want you to do. Go through the diagram. And by the time you're done, you should follow each step. And by the time you're done, your frog should be opened up just like the frog in the picture. That's what it should look like. But did anybody have the issue that when they were cutting and they were trying to cut open the frog's leg, instead of cutting this way, you cut this way, and you put a little too much pressure, and all of a sudden, you've got a little frog leg sitting in your hand that shouldn't be sitting in your hand. Completely severed off. What do you do? You sit there, you try to shove it back on there, see if, it, if you can wiggle it in and see if that works, and if that doesn't work, you take one of the pins, and you shove it through and try to see if that'll stick together, and it just doesn't seem to work. It just keeps severed. So what do you do? You sneak over to the trash can and you throw it away and you go back over and when the teacher comes over to your frog, you say, you gave me a one-legged frog. We could do that because that's really difficult, but what if we sat there and looked at it and said, I've really messed up. And we tried to sew the frog's leg back on. And we say, let me get out. I've got, I'm going to go down to Miss Carolyn Davis's class because I know she's got all the needle and thread I need. So let me go to her class. We'll get needle and thread. And you know what? We will sew this bad boy back on. But I will tell you, I've seen several kids cut a frog's leg off and never seen anybody try to sew it back on. I think part of the reason is is it's easier to take the C in the class than it is to try to sew that thing back on. The other thing is it takes time. And what if the skin rips and it's not able to sew back on? What if you can't do it? It's just easier not to try. I think that's what happens a lot of times in our severed relationships. Something's gotten in the way, whether on our end or theirs, and we just can't put it back together. There is just no matter what we do. We have gone to them and told them every reason why they are wrong and we are right. And they just don't get it. Why can't they see things through our eyes? We've tried everything. We've, we've even sent subliminal messages through Facebook that we say, some people just don't understand this, but if they understood this, it would be all much all better. And what do you think the person at home is thinking when they see that pop up on your Facebook page? Unfriend. I want nothing to do with them. And then it just causes a bigger schasm. 
bigger issues. We try to work and we try to do what's right. We want the relationship back together. But oftentimes we get to a point that we say, this just isn't what we've done doesn't work. Just throw it away. Sometimes we don't even get to that part. We don't even try. We just say, eh, this isn't going to work. Let's toss it. We don't need to worry about this relationship. We even use scripture to, to satisfy this. Dust the feet off and keep moving on. If they won't listen to what you have to say, just move on. But we're told by Paul in Romans 12, 18, when he's talking about how to handle people who have wronged them, he says, if it is possible, as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We are called to live at peace. And when Paul references peace, he doesn't just reference peace as in nobody fighting. He references peace as in unity in Christ. As long as you can help it, there should be unity with you and those around you. Now, this doesn't mean to live in a secluded world from everyone because I just can't get along with anyone. So I'm just going to, and I saw a picture of this when I typed in separated relationships. I'm going to get a big glass bottle and I'm just going to live in that glass bottle. You live in your glass bottle, I'll live in mine. That way, I won't have issues with anybody. But is that how God intended us to be? No, if that was how God intended us to be, then Christ wouldn't have prayed in the garden for those that would follow him to be united. Instead, we're to live with, to interact with, to work towards peace with everyone. Now, do you notice I said work towards peace? Our job is to do everything we can to live in peace and united under Christ with everyone. This doesn't mean that there will, I mean, this does mean that there will be some people who just won't want to be at peace with you. There will be some that say no. I, when I was a kid, my brother had actually brought home, uh, the teacher let him bring home some frogs, and we actually decided to try to sew frog legs back together to see if that would work. Some of them worked. Some of them didn't. So we had one leg. We had Eileen, and we had I hop. We're going to have relationships, though, where we have issues like that where we're going to try everything, and Christ says, I'm going to show you how to approach from your side fixing a relationship, what you can do. But again, there has to be a change of heart on the other person too. They have to be willing to accept it. But he says, if you want to restore relationships with others, I know how to do that. Let me tell you how. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul shares God's plan on how to overcome our side of a severed relationship. Because here's the other thing I've learned too. A lot of times we think the severed relationship is the fault of the other person. And we go in and we try to fix it. And if they would just listen to us, we are right. It's not always right. Sometimes there's an issue on our side too that we have to recognize. This is how Paul starts in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is Christ's instructions in the plan? He says, change your point of view and reconcile. As I got to thinking about this, what is a worldly point of view of people? Why? What is, what is this point of view? And a lot of times I came to realize we view life and people 
like we view dodgeball. You're either on our side or you're against us. Everything is a battle. You're either helping me get to my goal or you are going against me in my goal. And I think when we get to that, we start to view other people as our opponents or our enemies. And we often view it as you're wrong, we're right, and we have to prove why you're wrong. We have to come at you and let you know everything you've done wrong, and we have to work our hardest to debate you. What's funny to me is I sat there and I thought about that. I was like, man, it's a good thing most Christians aren't like that. And then I went on YouTube and I found all of these debates between Christians and non-Christians, between Baptist and Church of Christ, between Nazarene, and, and all of this all over the place is all debates, and I'm going to prove you wrong. That's what I'm here to do. You are the enemy. And as I was getting ready this morning, I kept thinking about that, and I thought, I know that's not right, and I'm going to preach. This is what we're supposed to view other people as. But then there's a verse that popped out to me. And in Ephesians 6, 12, this is what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We need to change our point of view. People who think differently than us are not the enemy. They are not our opponents. We are not trying to win over them. Instead, we are trying to win them over. As I got to thinking more and more about this, we're called to be new creations. We're being sanctified or set apart to look more and more like Christ every day. We're called to be different. We are the kid in the middle of the tag game that when they have people run back and forth and there's one kid in the middle, that kid's goal is to tag somebody else. And the whole purpose of tagging them is now they are a part of their team. And in some of those games, they now have to hold hands united in the middle, tagging other people. The other people aren't the enemy. They just want them to be a part of their group. They want to win them in. As God continues to work on us and we listen to his word and follow his commands, we need to have a new view of the world. We need to have Christ's view of the world. And Jesus explains this view in Matthew 5, 43 through 45. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. So God, the Son rises on good people and bad people. Sun rises on those who follow Christ and not. The rain comes for everybody. We talked about that this morning in Sunday school. That's been what we've been the point that comes across this whole month in Sunday school class. We need to quit focusing on these people or the bad people and focus on everybody needs God's love. We need to start loving people. When we change our mindset of you're wrong or you've wronged me. Do I love you and I know what you need? All of a sudden, people are a little more willing to talk to you. When you approach them, instead of saying, 
you're a terrible person to saying, I know someone who loves you for who you are. All of a sudden, attitudes start to flip. Conversations open back up. You're friended again on Facebook. But he doesn't stop at love. He doesn't just say change your worldview. He says, focus on reconciliation. Now that is a big word, and reconciliation, a lot of times when we think of it, we think of bank accounts. We try to reconcile our checkbook. For those of you who are not 55 years or older, a checkbook is this little thing, it's a piece of paper that you actually write out how much money you want to give to somebody. And you give it to them. And it's not like now where you go and use your debit card and all of a sudden it pops up on a piece of paper and you can go on your phone. Back in the day with a checkbook, you would spend money and then you'd have to make sure that the money you spent is the same money that's out of the bank account and you have to check your receipts to make sure. So you've got all these things that all have to match up. And let me see from a, just a nod of heads how many of you have hit an issue where your checkbook and your bank account didn't match up. And normally someone else wrote a check and didn't write it down in the ledger, right? It was never us. But you have to go in and then figure out what's wrong, why is this, how can we bring this all back together? When it comes to relationships, reconciliation involves a change in the relationship. Sometimes it's between God and man, and other times it's man and man. It assumes there has been a breakdown in the relationship, but now there's been a change from a state of enmity and fragmentation to one of harmony and fellowship. Jesus stresses this. He says you need to be reconciled. Matthew 5, 23 through 24, he's talking to someone who has sinned against someone else and their relationship is broken up. He says this, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Jesus says, you're coming to give a gift to worship God. That is awesome. But if you are not in a right relationship with somebody and you can fix it, that's more important to start with. He wants you to go back and fix that relationship, then come back and give your gift. He still says, come back and give the gift. That's still the important part. But in order for it to be full, the gift giving isn't just the act of giving the gift. It's your heart. And if you're broken with somebody else, you've got an issue. You see, this is happening in the Corinthian church. There was a guy who had had this really outrageous sin in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I mean, this guy was, it was messed up. It was related relations inside the family and all sorts of stuff and just not good. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13 addresses this and as he goes into it, he tells the church, hey, you've approached him, you've talked to him, he's not listening. You got to sever the relationship. You got to let him out on his own for a little bit so that he learns what's wrong. He tells them this, but much like a parent who tells your kid, make sure when you go to school that you wear your coat at recess and you drive past the school at recess and see your kid out without a coat, he's not sure whether they'll listen or not. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 5-11, through 11, Paul sees that they had. And he instructs them, this guy you've pushed out, Restore him. Bring him back in because he is repenting. 
We're going to look at that more tomorrow in the cup of Joe. But what he's saying is, you guys quit kicking him out. If he wants back in now and he's willing to repent and to follow Christ, reconcile with him. Don't hold it against him. Because even at the beginning of this section, it says, Paul references and realizes, this guy hasn't really hurt me that bad by what he did, but it's really hurt you. It's deeply offended you. But you need to forgive him. Bring him back in. But what's interesting to me is when you look at 2 Corinthians 2 and you look at what we've been looking at in 2 Corinthians 5, this reconciliation and bringing back to a right relationship isn't just about you and the other person. Actually, it's about reconciling them back to Christ. That's the whole goal because can we live in unity and peace until we're all reconciled in Christ? Until we all have a relationship with Christ? No. We need to bring them in and not just bring them in and say, hey, let's figure things out between us. No, first you need to figure things out between you and God. Let me tell you about what God has to say. Paul continues in 2 Corinthians, and he shares what God has provided to help us in reconciliation. In verses 18 through 19, he says this, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. says, you need help with this. You need to know how to reconcile. I gave you Jesus, the perfect reconciler. The person who was without sin was perfect in his relationship with us. And what did we do? We separated and cut him off. Jesus did nothing wrong. And yet, what was God's response when we separated and cut things off? I got a plan. You know what? I know they think they're doing the right thing, but they are going to need me. Yes, they've spit in my face. Yes, they've made a mockery of me. But you know what? I'm going to send my son Jesus to live among them, to love on them, to forgive them and to die on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins. That's what I'm going to do. That's how much I love them. You know what? Without Christ, we can't reconcile relationships or reconcile people to God. Christ is the only one who can do that. We need to be sharing that message. We've got all of this. In Romans 5, 10 through 11, I love the way it says it. For if while we were God's enemies, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We've been reconciled and now we are living in a right relationship and working towards a right relationship. That's this whole sanctification thing. We're set apart to be holy, but there's a long way for us to get there. We've got to follow what Christ said. And as we do that day by day, we get closer and closer. And the more we do it, the more we realize what Christ did. Don't you think so? The more you read your Bible, the more don't you go Oh, man, I can't believe what God has done for us. I can't believe how much God loves us. And as we get there, the end of verse 11, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And back up in verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5, 
He's committed us to the message of reconciliation. We should be excited to go out and tell everyone. Even those that we have broken relationships with. That should be what we're talking about. Not, well, I know you wanted mom's china and I wanted mom's china and I snuck in and stole mom's china. Here's the china back. That we talk about. Or you stole mom's china. I forgive you for that. That's all good. But that's not the issue. Hey, mom's china, we can talk about that another day. But what we need to talk about right now, I got to tell you what Christ has done in my life. I got to tell you about the love Christ has for you. That's what you need to know right now. That's the important thing. We need to quit getting so caught up on trying to prove others wrong and just prove Christ. We just need to show them Christ and show them Christ's love. Now, I do want to say something because there are going to be some that take this and run one way and some that take it and run another. When I say show them Christ's love, that does not mean come alongside of them and say, Christ loves you. Keep going and doing what you're doing. No. That means coming alongside of them and sharing the full gospel message. Christ loves you so much that he wants to free you from your sins so you don't have to sin anymore. Christ wants to come alongside of you. And you know what? I want to come alongside of you, too. Christ doesn't want you to have to suffer like you've been suffering doing it the way you're doing it. He loves you too much. And you know what? We sit there and we may go home today excited about this, going, yes, I'm ready to do this. But there are going to be moments that we go to talk to somebody. And we may even do this the right way and say, hey, I want to share Christ with you. And they may spout back something very hateful. They may just shut you out completely. And for us, a lot of times, what's, what's the reaction when someone does that? Fine, if you want to act like a butthead. Well, if you don't want to talk to me, fine, we don't have to talk no more. This is, this is really mean, but I've heard this before. Well, fine, if you don't want to hear about Jesus, you can go burn in hell for all I care. Yeah. But we slip into that because we slip back into viewing them as the enemy. So how do we keep from slipping back into that? 2 Corinthians 5.20, the first part of verse 20 says this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. The escape route to keep from going back to that. Remind yourself. You are Christ's ambassador. Ask the question, who do you represent? As I thought through that in my head, there was something that came to my mind right off the bat. When you were a young kid and you went on a field trip, what did your principal or teacher say as you were getting off the bus? Or for those of you a little older, getting off the horse and buggy. The teacher said, Remember who you represent. What you do reflects back on your mom, your dad, and the school. Remember who you represent. I think that's what we've got to think too when we go to talk to people and we share the message of Christ and we try to reconcile relationships is we need to remember who we represent. We're a representation of Christ. How we react to others, no matter how hateful or hurtful, still affects their view of Christ. God is choosing us to be the messenger. I love how that says it there. As though God were making his appeal through us. I've heard the elders use this, and Stan, you've said this a lot. God uses men to spread his message. He could send angels down, but did any of you get witnessed to by an angel? No. He could use a donkey. Did any of you get witnessed to by a donkey? 
if you say yes and look at your spouse next to you, wrong. But, did he? No, he uses men and women to go around and do this. That's the way God does this. He uses us. But when he uses us, he wants us to do it right. We go up and, Jesus loves you. You want to come to church? You think that's how? No. God, it says God is making his appeal. Hey, God loves you so much. Oh, I can't tell you how much he loves you. It's hurting him what you're doing. Because he knows it's going to cause so much pain. And when people yell at us, tell us to go away, never want to talk to us again, what does God say? I love you and I'm still here for you. If you want to come to me. I'm not allowed to do a whole sermon on this because you had about 10 of them in one year. But the prodigal son, he stands there and the father waits and waits for his son to come back. If people won't talk to you, you tell them, I'm still here for you. Even if, you're, even if you don't want to come back yet, you don't want to hear what I have to say yet, I am still here for you. Every once in a while, just remind them, hey, I'm here for you. When we do that, all of a sudden what you'll realize is our message with people, our relationships with people, we don't sit there anymore and go, man, I wish I could do something to fix this. We know we've done everything Christ has called us to. We need to make sure that our message to people, and actually not just our message to people out there, there are some of you in here today that need to hear this message too. If you've got a separated relationship with God, you need to hear what 2 Corinthians 5, 20b through 21 has to say. And when I read this afterwards, we're going to pray, and then the praise team is going to come up. We're going to sing a song. And if you want to talk more about what this says, I encourage you, please come forward. If you want to pull me aside afterwards, you can. Um, if you want to pull an elder aside afterwards, you can. If you want to talk to somebody, we're here to talk to you more about this. If you want to know, hey, I'm trying to tell somebody this, but I struggle with it. I don't know how to. We'd love to talk with you about this. But this is the message that we all need to hear ourselves, and we all need to be spreading to others. And it's this. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm going to say that again, and I'm going to say that to all of you here today. We as the church, the church leadership, all of us who proclaim Christ, we implore you on Christ's behalf. We come today asking you, be reconciled to God. Get in a right relationship with God. Accept the forgiveness of Christ. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Dear God, we come right now thanking you for sending Jesus to reconcile us. Lord, we know that we messed up and we wrote more checks because of sin than we can cash and we are way uneven with you, Lord. We cannot be in a right relationship with you and I pray, Lord, and thank you that you sent Jesus to forgive us of those sins so that we can be freed from that life of sin. Set apart to live holy for you, Lord. But Lord, right now, there's a lot of us out there that are struggling. There are many of us 
who have relationships that we we want to fix, but we just can't fix them. They just remain broken. Lord, if we've not shared this message yet, if we've not changed our viewpoint from they're wrong and we're right to you're right and they need you, Lord, change our hearts. Change the way we view people. Allow us to love people like you love us so that we can share your message like Christ shared. Lord, give us grace so that we can show grace to others. Be with us as we continue to live in this world full of sin and struggle and strife and stress. And allow us, Lord, to shine bright for you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, as the praise team comes forward, I want to encourage you. If you need to talk to someone, I'm right here. The elders are out there. We are here for you. Stand with us as we sing.